Hi, my name is Kent Cordry, and I'm the uh, founder and president of a company called GeoWinsight, and also the inventor of the HydroSleeve. Today I'm going to be talking about the HydroSleeve and actually how it compares to traditional groundwater sampling methods. And then the latter half of the presentation is actually going to cover the HydroSleeve itself and uh, advantages and limitations that are unique to that particular no-purge sampler. I'm going to start out by basically showing a slide of our corporate campus here and we're pretty much the definition of a cottage industry. We're on an acre of land in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, actually in the middle of pecan groves. And we do work out, this is our main office where we work out of. We also have a shop on the other side of the property that serves as a uh, workshop and also a warehouse space. But what we're really proud of here is as soon as we moved over here in 2008, we actually installed monitoring wells and we're now on our third uh, actually set of wells. We have four inch wells for testing four inch uh, hydro sleeves and other types of equipment. But we find for us basically the two inch size is one that we run into the most limitations with and have to work on the most. So we've actually sleeved the four inch wells with two inch wells. And then we have a well cluster of several two-inch wells installed to the same depth plus a one-inch well. And these things get a lot of use. Basically, about once a week at least, somebody's out there testing new devices or trying something. And uh, it's actually probably the, our biggest asset here at, uh, at GeoInsight. What is no-purge sampling? Basically, no-purge sampling is pretty much self-explanatory. You want to collect a sample without purging the well first, but I have from a defined interval underlined on this slide. And by a defined interval, the sampling device that you use to collect a no-purge groundwater sample has to be able to collect a sample from where you want the water to come into the sampling device. And typically it's within the well screen, which is highlighted on this slide in the light blue. And obviously you do that without prior purging. There are several other types of sampling methodologies out there, actually two major ones. One of them is volume purging and the other one is low flow sampling. They're pretty much accepted sampling technologies. But why would you want to convert from one of those sampling technologies to no purge sampling? And one thing I do want to point out is we're seeing probably since about 2008 to 2010 a rapid increase in the use of no purge groundwater samplers. Number one, it does allow you to collect a formation quality sample. By formation quality, we mean representative of the aquifer surrounding the well screen. It saves time and money, typically 50 to 80 percent of the groundwater sample collection cost. They're simple to use and basically simple logistically. Uh, a lot of these are one-person operations. And the simplicity of them uh, actually reduces the number of variables in the sampling methodology. So they're pretty much repeatable. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference who's doing the sample collection out there. Uh, it's much more repeatable than, let's say, bailing a well. And finally, it's a greener sampling methodology. Uh, without purge water, obviously, you don't have the purge water disposal. Most of these devices are designed to be run with one person, so there's minimal energy consumption in terms of doing it. And there's also less exposure to safety hazards. Without contaminated purge water slopping around, you don't have that worry, as well as pumps, generators, heavy equipment out there. So the safety hazards actually are reduced compared to most, uh, particularly volume purging, and even compared to low flow sampling. And this is a very, very condensed version. Actually, this is slide six of seven. This is a very, very condensed version of uh, the history of groundwater sampling, or the evolution. Volume purging basically came about in the late 1970s, and this is right when people began to look at groundwater contamination. Uh, and this is a kind of a cursive look. It wasn't really in-depth like we're doing now. But uh, volume purging was used primarily for purging the water systems out prior to collecting the sample. And that's been around, really uh, kind of became enshrined though in about 1986 with volume purging uh, with the technical enforcement guidance document that was issued by EPA at that time. And that was pretty much the go-to document in the mid 80s. Low flow sampling came about in the 1990s, actually was introduced in the uh, 
late 1980s and it was kind of forwarded by EPA and also U.S. Geological Survey and some folks using a colloidal bore scope out of Grand Junction, Colorado. But the whole concept began to evolve, took got more traction in the 1990s and now it pretty much started replacing volume purging from let's say early 1990s till present. No purge, the first time I've ever heard of it was in 1997 uh, and that was in an uh, article written in Groundwater Monitoring and Remediation by Don Verbleski and I think it was William Hyde uh, with General Electric, Don, Dr. Don Verbleski with the, was with the USGS and that was the introduction to the passive diffusion bag samplers, which were the first ones that were really commercially available and had made some inroad into the groundwater sampling market. Now, what I'm going to be discussing is the various types of groundwater sampling methods and their effects actually on the sample. And this kind of comes into play in the differences between volume purging low flow sampling and no purge sampling. As I mentioned, volume purging has been around really since the late 1970s, but in the mid to early, actually early 1980s, various research institutes like uh, uh, University of Waterloo in Canada and Illinois State Geological Survey started studying wells to some degree and determined that if you purge three to five times volume out of the water contained within the well and the surrounding filter pack, typically you could get a representative groundwater sample or basic volume purging. Anybody who's done a lot of field work under inclement weather conditions knows three to five times the volume actually turns out to be about three times the volume because you want to get back in the truck or indoors as fast as possible. But the concept, as I mentioned, was kind of pioneered by folks back in the uh, mid to uh, early 1980s. And what they determined using tracers and various sort of downhole instrumentation was that the stagnant water that was above the top of the well screen was not representative of what was in the aquifer. But a well under ambient conditions did have the advective flow going through the well screen as well as diffusion from outside the well screen into the well screen. So conceptually, if you could get down into that portion of the screen, collect your sample and get it back out without entraining any water on the top, you were good. And actually somebody uh, back in the mid 1980s had proposed a syringe type sampler to do that. What ultimately came out of it though, they determined if you took out three to five times the standing water within the well and the surrounding filter pack, Basically, you would purge the stagnant water from above the top of the well screen out and you could collect a representative sample of the surrounding aquifer. In other words, you were getting the fresh water coming in and you didn't have to worry about entraining the stagnant water. Well, let's look at what happens when you do that. Basically, you're going to turn the well into a blender. Uh, a lot of times you're purging at as fast a rate as possible, primarily to keep the time in the field down. And whether you use a, a baler or a pump, you're removing water out of the well, blending it in from it, uh, various zones, and actually the zone with the highest permeability is going to contribute the greatest amount of water coming out of there. But it does remove the stagnant water. So you have a, when you start purging, you begin to extend, instead of collecting a sample out of the well screen, you're reaching out into the formation, various distances, either horizontally and vertically. The advantages of volume purging, it is probably the most standard and accepted methodology out there now. And it's been around for a long, long time. As I mentioned in 1986, it was pretty much enshrined in terms of sampling methodologies by uh, the technical enforcement guidance document that was issued there by EPA. You can go anywhere in the United States and go, oh, we're gonna do three to five well volumes and collect a sample and it's almost always going to be accepted and the people reviewing the regulators will be familiar with the technology. It's easy to understand and implement. It doesn't take a, you know, a whole lot of training to count three to five volumes of the well and calculate it. It averages the full screened interval. The plus side to this is if you're trying to do an interceptor well or a detection well to find out if there's anything leaking out of a source, by doing that, you're going to find that the um, sample will probably pick up something, but it may be diluted way down from its actual concentration in the zone that it's occurring. And I've got this asterisk number four, it collects an unlimited sample volume. And 
this is important, particularly compared to no purge sampling, because as we'll see later, it's one of the primary limitations that we see with no purge sampling. Limitations to volume purging. The data quality is prone to inconsistency, and this is particularly true if you happen to be using a baler. It's expensive and time consuming. It takes quite a while, to, particularly if you have a long water column and a large diameter well to purge that volume out. And it generates a large volume of purge water, which, if contaminated, has to be drummed up and disposed of properly, which can be quite expensive. Now, this slide to the right, we see the date on it, 3392. And I believe this photo was taken in 98. So handling of that can be a real pain. It samples the full screen interval, but it samples a lot more than that also. And it has a tendency to mobilize solids and colloidal sized particles that wouldn't normally be mobile in the aquifer. So it results, sometimes results in increased turbidity. And this is particularly true with a baler that fits relatively tightly within the well. When we start purging, we uh, create a cone of depression or drawdown in that well, so we accelerate the entrance velocity of the uh, fluid going into the well. So we pick up that velocity. We also pick up uh, colloidal sized particles and actually increase turbidity within the well. And we reach way above and way below the bottom of the well screen in terms of our sample interval depending on the hydrogeologic conditions of the aquifer or the dynamics of the aquifer. And you can reach way out into the formation to bring a sample in. So when you sample three to five volumes, or purge three to five volumes prior to collecting a sample, you really don't have any idea what the source of that sample is. And if we look at the portion of the slide on the right, the top view, uh, how far out that sample interval goes horizontally, we really don't know, and it can be to a fairly large extent. So you may be bringing in fluid that's not even intercepted by the well screen, but may be contaminated or not contaminated. So really defining exactly where that sample came from can take a whole lot of time and a whole lot of research, and you, you still may never know really what the source of it was. With low flow sampling, uh, you can see from this slide it requires a little more equipment than volume purging, but it, as I said, it became accepted uh, pretty much in the early 90s and then it's been growing. I would assume it's probably still expanding its, its scope. One thing I would like to say, I, I should have said with volume purging, still the majority of the samples are collected by volume purging of some type or another. Um, it's not a huge margin like it used to be, low flow sampling is caught up, and then no purge sampling is beginning to make some inroads into the overall groundwater sampling uh, arena also. But still volume purging is done at more sites than any other sampling method. The concept behind low flow, the well under ambient condition has advective flow and diffusive flow, and what we want to do is get below this stagnant water level, collect a sample, and hopefully do it without pulling the stagnant water down into the sampling device itself. And this is usually done by pumping. It cannot, you cannot do low flow sampling with a baler because you mix that fluid in the stagnant water zone in with the sample and you end up collecting a sample that's not representative of the surrounding formation. Okay. With low flow sampling, you're going to be purging at a very slow pumping rate. And purging is not exactly the right description. What you want to do is establish a little bit of drawdown, but minimize the amount of drawdown in the well. And then what is done is you're monitoring, monitoring indicator parameters coming out of the flow through cell at the surface. And by monitoring these, when these parameters stabilize, and the parameters may be electrical conductivity, temperature, um, pH and uh, DO. But when these parameters stabilize, the assumption is that you're normally pulling water in in equal portions from the well screen and portions of the formation. If we look at what low flow sampling actually does, we want to pull this water in from below the well screen in the screened interval, but not suck down basically any of the water above the well screen in the stagnant portion of the aquifer. Now, the thing is with low flow sampling, you, the longer you pump, 
the longer, until the well equilibrates, or in other words, the longer, and also the pumping speed makes a difference on how large your sample zone is. The advantages of low flow sampling are better data. It's more repeatable. You have more control over the variables that are coming in, and you don't stress the well like you do with volume purging and begin to mobilize colloidal particles and bring stuff in at a high rate of speed like you would if you volume purged. Uh, obviously, the reduced purge water volume is important. As we talked about with volume purging, it can be very expensive to dispose of all of these uh, particular items. And uh, it can be less expensive, and most usually it is a little less expensive than volume purging, or a lot less expensive, depending on how much purge water you have to deal with. And it's normally accepted by the regulators, and it's almost universally accepted by the regulatory community now. And you get it, once again, the asterisk, an unlimited sample volume, assuming you're out there willing to pump at a rate. Typically, low flow sampling is pumped at a rate of 250 mils per minute or less. And if you can handle that pumping rate and you need five gallons of water, you can stay out there and collect five gallons of sample if need be. The limitations of low flow sampling. Number one, it's got, as you could tell from the initial slide, there's a pretty high equipment cost to get set up and do this. If you're doing portable sampling using a low flow system, it's not as bad as dedicating one to each one. Well, if you do a dedicated system, eventually it'll probably recoup the cost of the portable system. Um, it requires operator training, and this is true. It's not something that you just walk out to the first day, give somebody a half hour training on it, and they'll probably be able to do effectively. It takes a little more time and a little more um, basically effort, I don't want to say effort, but more time and education to do low flow sampling correctly. Uh, and sometimes it's not that much faster, or maybe no faster than volume purging. You do get in situations where the parameters don't stabilize immediately, and you can sit out there for a long period of time waiting for them to come in to stabilize before you can collect the sample. And samples from an undefined interval. Now, if you recall when we talked about volume purging, we saw this to be the case also. But with low flow sampling, it's not to the same degree as volume purging. In other words, the source of the sample, how far it extends above and below the well screen is really going to depend on how long it takes the parameters to stabilize and the aquifer's characteristics. And the horizontal reach into the aquifer is still going to occur also because you're pulling water in from outside of the screen. But that effective sample radius, if we look at the top view on the right, uh, is going to be much less than the sample radius if you uh, do volume purging. So it's coming from an undefined interval, but it's more defined than volume purging. With no purge sampling, this is uh, what we're actually the topic of the discussion today for the most part, but with no purge sampling, these devices have been around really since about, uh, as I mentioned, 1997, but commercially became available right around 2000. No purge sampling, the way this works, is going back to the picture that we had of the well under ambient conditions. The water is going to be flowing through the well screen, but what we're going to do is reach down from the surface, go through the um, stagnant water, and not collect any sample, and only collect the sample out of the well screen. And by doing that, what we're doing is actually collecting the water that flows by the sampling device. And in this case, let's say this is a passive diffusion bag sampler. We're only going to collect a sample of the water flowing by that device. So it's a very uh, precise or very defined vertical and horizontal interval. The advantages of no purge sampling, and I'm going to run through these real quick because we talked about it earlier. Collects a formation quality sample, can save time and money, simple to use and very simple logistics, and is a greener, more less intrusive sampling methodology. The limitations. It's relatively new, uh, meaning that regulators Actually, probably half of them at least are not familiar with the technology outside of here, maybe hearing it mentioned one place or another. Uh, this is kind of common to any new technology. We saw with the low flow sampling, it took a long period of time to reach acceptance. 
This is taking a while, it's, although the rate of acceptance is accelerating rapidly now over the last three to four years. A limited sample volume. It is a one-shot sample method, and what you define, your volume is limited by the amount of water in the well screen. Uh, results don't always act, match purging in all wells, and the sample comes from a very defined interval. In other words, if you're looking for detection of something and you have a 30-foot well screen, putting one no-purge sampling device in a 30-foot well screen is not going to cover the same area as putting a pump in there and pumping uh, you know, five casing volumes out. So it is a very defined interval. This is the basic difference between the sampling methodologies, and if you happen to see differences, the primary reason you see the differences. Number one, with volume purging, you're purging a large quantity of water out of the well, reaching out uh, distances horizontally and vertically above and below the well screen. And <clears throat> defining exactly where that sample comes from is very difficult. No purge sampling on the other end of the spectrum collects a sample solely out of the water that's flowing through the well screen and uh, it comes from a very precise uh, vertical and horizontal interval. Low flow sampling is somewhere in between the two. Uh, it does reach out into the formation, pulls water in, but not nearly to the extent that volume purging does and not nearly as limited as no purge sampling. Now, I'm going to be talking about the hydro sleeve, and this particular sampling device was actually invented in 1999, and we did our first testing in October of 99, and then really kind of became on the market in about 2004 to 2005 is where we first started really selling any sort of quantities of them. Now, the hydro sleeve is a very simple device. It's basically uh, three to four pieces. You have a reusable weight and clip. And then the sleeve itself, and the hydro sleeve itself consists of an elongated uh, polyethylene lay flat tube that's sealed at the bottom. And if you look off to the right, we look at the check valve. And the check valve over here is actually a collapsing type reed valve. And what that does, I'll get into the explanation in a minute, but it allows water to flow through in one direction. But if it tries to go back, exit the bag after the bag's full, it collapses on itself and seals the sample in it. So how does it work? It collects a water sample for all contaminants from a defined interval within the well screen and seals itself on recovery, which is pretty much our explanation of a no-purge sampling device. I want to point out balers do not work for low-flow sampling, nor do they work for low, uh, no-purge sampling, because a baler will pump itself, both the single and dual check valve baler, the standard ones, will pump themselves coming up out of the well. So and actually going down, they drag the material down in with them. But it's, I, that was the very first thing we tried in the way of a technology for no purge sampling uh, using dye studies and columns of water. And after about two weeks of working on it, it just does not work. The way the hydro sleeve works, the hydro sleeve goes in empty and sealed. And then when you deploy it or recover it, it fills itself up and then seals itself again. So basically, it doesn't entrain any of the uh, stagnant water in the casing as it's being lowered into position. The hydro sleeve and some of these photos and drawings of the hydro sleeve are quite old. The operation principle remains the same, although the construction and style of the sleeve may look a little different. This is one of the earlier versions. But as it goes in, the hydrostatic pressure that goes in in the flat con configuration and the water pressure actually has a tendency to squeeze it flatter and flatter as it's going down. And it also keeps that check valve closed. So as you're lowering it through the water column, it really doesn't pick up any water at all. And one thing I want to point out with the hydro sleeve and uh, many of the, well, almost all the other no purge devices is that they can be left in the wells between sample intervals and are only activated when they're recovered. Passive diffusion bags, snap samplers, uh, P, let's see, some of the other devices. They can all be left in the wells between sample intervals. So once you've made your first deployment, what you do is recover that one, put another one on, drop it in the well, leave it in the well until three months, six months, a year later, and you do your next round of sampling. 
It's one of the real advantages of using no purge sampling devices. So anyway, we've got the hydro sleeve going down and it's compressed and flat as it goes down. When we want to collect the sample after the well has returned to equilibration, and you do need the well to allow time to equilibrate, particularly if the device fits very tightly on the well. The hydro sleeve has an advantage of, let's say, a 625 ml unit, really only displaces about uh, 75 ml of fluid going down, and it's like a ribbon with a weight on the bottom going in. So there's very little mixing or disturbance to the water column, particularly if you're in a four inch well, there's basically none. But once the well is returned to equilibrium, then to collect the sample, what you would do is pull up on the hydro sleeve. And now when you do that, all of a sudden you have pressure on the upper portion of the sampler, the top sampler, and it works like a wind sock or pulling on a sock. The water pressure forces open that check valve Water flows into the sampler and actually fills, and you literally cut a core of the water column within the well. When it's full, like a cup, can't get any more fluid into it, you get back pressure on the check valve, and the check valve will close, so it can be recovered through the stagnant water in the casing without getting that water into the well screen itself. And this is, uh, once again, one of the older versions, but it's a picture that was taken at a site in New Mexico, and it's where a, a petroleum tank had been removed. And this was a hydro sleeve sample collected out of that tank. What happened is this was early on, and they did a comparison of the hydro sleeve and then bailed the well, which is a standard procedure at that site, and collected a groundwater sample also. Well, if you look and you see the hydro sleeve sample, there's very little colloidal particles and low turbidity in the sample. And you looked at the baled sample, and you can see there was quite a bit of entrained solid material in it. What was interesting is when sampled for most of the VOCs, all of these, uh, they compared very closely. But ethyl benzene, which has a tendency to glom onto soil particles, were much higher in the baled sample than in the hydro sleeve. So what we can kind of conclude from this is uh, if you're really elevating the turbidity of your sample and the process of your sampling methodology, particularly at petroleum sites or sites where you have contaminants that like to adhere to soil particles or colloidal sized particles, you're elevating and you're getting a lot of false positives in your baled sample. Why use the hydro sleeve for sampling? We mentioned collects a formation quality sample. And this particular one is near and dear to me. This is the very first one that was ever collected using a hydro sleeve. And this is in Northern California in about 19, well, 1999. And you can see compared to the purged in sample, the hydro sleeve sample compared very, very closely. And had it not, I wouldn't have pursued the technology or applied for the patents, et cetera. So it does do this. And I, I give this talk and people go, well, do you have any other comparisons? Uh, the hydro sleeve and actually almost all these no purge devices, uh, passive diffusion bag snap samplers have more comparisons probably than any other type uh, low flow to volume purging ever did. And what I'm going to do is at the end we have uh, numerous independent studies that are posted on our website and almost every one of them has a comparison study of one type or another. Uh, the link to that or the slide with the links to that will appear on the uh, at the end of the talk here. Why hydro sleeve sampling? Uh, the logistics, and this is actually true for a lot of the no purge sampling devices, but the simple logistics really help out and it's hard to fathom uh, how simple they can be. So as an example, this is a initial shipment to install hydro sleeves in 45 wells. And the overnight envelope contains basically all the hydro sleeves required for this first round of sampling. And the boxes contain the reusable weights and the tether uh, are also uh, for those wells. Now, the follow-up round of sampling, six months later, this is what was sent, basically an overnight envelope full of hydro sleeves. The weights and the tether and clips, if clips were included, are all reusable. The sleeves are disposable, so once they're used, you uh, puncture them to get the sample out with the discharge straw and then go ahead and throw them away and put a new one on there. Um, 
And speaking of the use of them, once again, on the website under uh, instructional videos, there are a, uh, probably five or ten different videos showing how to assemble discharge hydro sleeves in various configurations. Why hydro sleeve sampling saves time and money? About 50 to 80 percent, and these numbers seem to be pretty much true. 50 percent is about the minimum. 80% of the field sampling cost is about the maximum we've ever seen. This is a case study that was actually done in New England. This was quite some time ago, probably about 2010. And at this particular site, it was a Superfund site, a landfill, and there were 30 wells out there, 30 to 200 feet deep. It was an annual sampling event, and the original method was EPA, portable low flow sampling, they had two trucks that they used and four people, two per truck, doing the sampling. Hydro sleeve uh, the hydro sleeve method, the no purge method, was the hydro sleeve. Okay. Uh, the low flow sampling required two weeks, four people, and two trucks. The hydro sleeve required four days with two people and one truck. So the cost savings on this was pretty substantial. The time savings was pretty substantial. This was a comparison study also. They ended up converting over to using the hydro sleeve and have been using it ever since for that particular site. This is a comparison of the sampling cost based on the McClellan Air Force Base report in 2005. And this was actually done by the Corps of Engineers and uh, other groups, the DOE groups, and looked it was actually a pretty complex project. There were numerous wells, there were four inch wells at this site where they actually did clusters of no purge sampling devices in the same well, collected sam samples simultaneously, and then went in and did low flow sampling using a portable low flow system, and then cranked up the discharge volume and did volume purge sampling and compared all the anal analytical results together. It was really quite an operation. There's probably not going to be another one out there like that ever again because it was a large, a large amount of funding required to pull it off, and logistically it was pretty complex. But this report was published in 2005, and the other thing they did is they took very accurate track of the cost to do the groundwater sampling using the various different methodologies. And these were based on using a two-person team to collect the samples. And as you can see, the volume purging was the highest at about, what, $270 maybe a sample. The low flow came in at right around 200 And then at the other end of the spectrum, the passive diffusion bags, PDBS, and the hydro sleeves were all in the $60 to $70 range per sample. So the cost savings is pretty good, and this whole scenario is pretty much played out this way at most of the sites where no purge sampling devices have been used at. Uh, this report also is posted on our website and uh, is available under the independent study section. And it's independent. I mean, nobody paid, none of the uh, participants paid for placement in them or anything like that. Finally, I had mentioned a greener sampling method. And the interesting thing about the no purge sampling and the hydro sleeve in particular is without any purge water to dispose of, there's a tremendous cost savings. And also, the energy consumption, literally one person for most practical aspects could collect a sample on a bicycle if you could lug the coolers around to do it. Uh, less exposure to safety hazards was something we discovered actually um, but, well, it was discovered by somebody else, but we stumbled across, and this was a site in Kentucky uh, refinery where I guess they had been bailing to uh, collect samples out of the well and putting the purge water in a poly, 350-gallon uh, poly drum or tank in the back of a pickup, and the tank had slipped and almost um, crushed a, a field tech out there, so they were under a mandate to find a safer sampling methodology, and they did find that no purge sampling, obviously you didn't have the water, uh, purge water to haul around. And also the other big plus on this is you don't have the compressors or generators or air tanks to uh, haul around to power something to bring the sample to the surface. Pretty much all of these devices are used manually. 
Limitations. Number one, and this is what any sort of uh, new device introduced in the environmental field or any field for that matter face is it's still relatively new. And it is becoming accepted at a much more rapid pace than it was two years ago and most definitely more than 10 years ago. But it is still relatively new and the regulatory, uh, the comfort level with the regulators has improved dramatically, but it's still not totally accepted. Uh, but here, the one underlined is by far the biggest limitation, and it's a practical limitation to no purge sampling. You're limited by no purge definition to the amount of water that's contained within the well screen. You cannot bring any more water in or else you're purging or doing low flow sampling. And last one, the results don't always match the other methods in all wells. Well, let's look at uh, volume limitation first, which is the most prominent. This is a diagram of if you had a four inch well, the available water in a four inch schedule 40 well is going to be about 25 liters. Now, literally most of these sampling devices, uh, the hydro sleeve uh, collects a very large volume compared to most, is gonna be about half of that volume. So what does that come to? Maybe 12 liters or something like that of water. <clears throat> and you see off to the right in parentheses, weight limited. And by weight limited, what we're talking about is literally, if this is going to be a manually operated thing, that's a lot of weight to pull out is 12 liters. The two inch wells are the ones where we actually, and four inch wells are not that big of a problem collecting sample volume out of. Two inch wells are, which if you recall one of the earlier slides, we had the pictures of our wells on the property. We've actually sleeved down a lot of the four inch, put two inch ones inside of them just for testing purposes because so much of the uh, volume issues come out of two inch wells. In a two inch well, you can practically get about three and an absolute maximum of four liters. And in the parentheses over there, they're both length and weight limited. The only way you get more volume out of a two inch well is make a longer sampling device. And we'll see some pictures there later. One inch wells, you only have 1.7 liters to sample in there. We do make a hydro sleeve that fits a one inch well, but it typically picks up about three, a little more than 300 uh, milliliters of sample. So the volume is very limited coming out of these one inch wells. This is just a picture of actually the limitations that you find. And uh, the hydro sleeves are designed or we can be used by one person as long as they're of practical length and practical practical weight. And what we found using a hydro sleeve and a two inch well, your practical length is about five feet long, which is a little over two and a quarter liters. That's shown by the sampler on the left, and that can be actually handled by one person in the field. On the right, we have what we call a turbo sleeve, which is pushing the limit. That'll hold four liters of sample. It's eight feet long, and it really would be best to have two people out there when you're running these in and out of the well. Four liters is going to weigh almost eight pounds, a little more than eight pounds, not counting the weight of the sampling device itself. So for two inch wells, if you can get by with three liters or less you can, in a 10 foot saturated well screen, you're probably pretty good. If you've got to get up to four liters, it's going to be a pain, particularly with one person. Uh, the guidelines for four inch wells would be the maximum hydro sleeve weight that a single person can handle is about six or eight pounds. In other words, about four liters coming out of the well. The photograph below actually shows two stacked, what we call two liter samplers. Actually, they hold about uh, three liters. The one on the top, if you can run one of them, it's fine. There's no problem at all. And here's where the weight comes in. If you're pulling six liters of sampling device out of a well, everything is fine until you clear the water table. You know, a full sample bag, water is going to weigh exactly as the same as the surrounding water, so there's really no weight differential until these things clear the water table. Then you're encountering the limitation of how much a person can pull out. Now, we've had people pull out like as much as nine liters or ten liters out of wells, but typically they're using some sort of mechanical winch at the top to recover it. Uh, you can recover it again manually as long as the samplers are below the water table, but once you have to pull them up through the upper portion, uh, 
of the well where you aren't submerged, the weight rapidly becomes a limit. This is actually, there was a group of the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, ITRC, sort of pioneered the use of passive or no purge sampling devices, and this is dating back to the early 2000s. Among this group, and it was a consortium of regulators and interested parties and laboratories, etc., that were interested in the emergence of the no purge groundwater sampling. As this came out, what happened was two of the laboratories back then, it was Severn Trent and also Columbia Analytical, they've both been sold and have changed, had several change, name changes since then, but looked at the total sample volume a laboratory usually asked for and then what it could use, actually uses for the analysis and what it could easily get by as a minimum volume. And this was uh, actually compiled of several sheets, and this is just a little segment taken out of one. But as you can see, if you look at the standard volume asked for, let's say for BNAs, uh, a liter, and what they actually used was 250 mLs. And this was just using normal laboratory equipment, not any high volume injectors or injections or anything like that. So you can see the laboratory typically asks for quite a bit more sample than it normally needs. And what we did is just took, let's say, a range of analytes and put them down there and calculated what the lab would ask for. And in this particular case, it's, if you look at these, it's almost four liters. And what they could get by with was about 600 mLs a sample. There's a huge difference between four liters and 600 mLs a sample when it comes to sampling a two inch well with a hydro sleeve or any other type of no purge sampling device. So what we're seeing is actually Test America now and some of these other labs are actually coming out and promoting the use of low volume uh, analysis and not only from the use of uh, saving the sample volume, but also uh, using uh, solvents and extraction chemicals and shipping costs are obviously quite a bit less. Now, another one is, okay, we did a round of comparison sampling of 20 wells and one or two of them don't compare very well. Why does that occur? Well, we look at the difference of what the source of the water. And when you're doing volume purging, you have this massive amount of water coming into the well from a large vertical interval and a pretty good sized horizontal extent. And all this is going to depend on the aquifer characteristics themselves. No purge sampling, on the other hand, is coming from the water that's flowing through the well screen and immediately surrounding the sampling device. So you have a very defined, uh, limited interval that that water is entering. Low flow sampling, again, kind of comes between the two. And one of the things I would like to mention is that no purge devices typically compare better to low flow samples than they do volume purging. And why is that? They're a little more similar. Low flow sampling is not bringing water in from quite the extreme distances around the uh, well screen. And the hydro sleeve samples are limited, to, or the no purge samples also limited to coming only out of the well screen. So there is a difference between. Sometimes these things will match up perfectly, other times not so much. It really depends on the aquifer characteristics. Standpipe studies were done uh, at um, actually the Stenis, I think it's Stennis or Stennis, um Space Center in Louisiana, but what they did is they had a long standpipe that would be spiked with uh, known contaminants and mixed and kept at the same concentration. And they used no purge devices immediately adjacent to a discharge spigot and collected the sample using the no purge device and the sample out of the discharge spigot at about the same time. Not about, at exactly the same time. And what they found is basically if you sampled the same water, you got the same results. And that's kind of the difference between you, no purge sampling, low flow sampling, and volume purging. If the water coming into the well screen is the same, you've got this pretty much the same results. Sometimes you'll have higher concentrations in the no purge, sometimes you'll have lower. But This is just a recently completed study. As a matter of fact, we just received it last month. But once again, it compares the differences in the source of the sample. 
Uh, this was done in Kansas City, and it was actually a two-step hydro sleeve sampling procedure. The second step was combined, shown as step two on the slide, was combined with a submersible pump, low flow pump, to collect a sample. Now, the hydro sleeve, first of all, from step one, was deployed in the well. The well was allowed to re-equilibrate, and then the hydro sleeve sample was collected in normal fashion. Immediately thereafter, a low flow pump was lowered into the center of the well screen at the same depth as the original hydro sleeve was, but what was different was this low flow pump also had suspended below it another hydro sleeve, and the hydro sleeve remained collapsed and didn't fill with fluid um, during the pumping procedure. And what they did is they basically did a low flow sampling using the pump, waited for parameter stabilization, and collected a sample at the surface. Once that sample was collected, when the pump was withdrawn, the hydro sleeve was pulled, the second hydro sleeve was pulled through the zone where the pump had collected the sample and cut a core of the water out of that same area at almost exactly the same time. And that sample was recovered to the surface. The results were pretty interesting. The first step one hydro sleeve that was collected out of the well screen without any other disturbance to the well ended up uh, providing a sample that compared to about 18% uh, RPD of about 18% to the pump sample that was collected later after parameters had stabilized low flow pump sample. But the sample of the hydro sleeve that was recovered through the zone where the low flow pump had collected its sample compared within about 5%, which is a very tight comparison. It's basically about the same as you would get out of a duplicate sample. So what it shows you is that the uh, source of the water from the aquifer in this particular case had a far greater influence on the concentrations in the sample than the actual sampling method. And pretty much what we had pointed out earlier, the source of the water makes a bigger difference in transporting the sample from the well screen to the surface. The features, the number one, and this is compared to other no-purge sampling devices of the hydro sleeve. Number one, it can camp sample all contaminants. It's a grab type sampling device. So assuming you have adequate sample volume, you can analyze for any of the contaminants that you can run. Now, I mentioned sample volume being the biggest limitation. It seems for radionuclides or radioactive contaminants, large volumes are almost uh, always requested. And if you can't get that amount of volume using a hydro sleeve, you're probably going to be pumping that sample. Uh, they're very simple to use. Uh, it doesn't take hardly, it takes very little field training to actually deploy them and recover them and discharge the sample, but the simplicity of it is also nice because it allows for repeatability. Really doesn't make a difference, much of a difference at all at the speed the thing is recovered. It still fills at the same rate, which is about a one-to-one -one ratio during recovery. And then it, uh, so the person putting it in, deploying it, and recovering it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference on the concentrations found in the sampler. It also provides the greatest sample volume of any of the no-purge sampling devices out there to get four liters out of a two-inch well. And like I say, it's tough, but that's about the maximum that you're going to get. And it also provides, in conjunction with that, the most sample volume per dollar of the no-purge sampling devices. In other words, your cost per liter of sample is less than any of the other no-purge devices. The bottom line is switching to the hydro sleeve can provide you a formation quality groundwater sample with 50 to 80 percent reduction in the cost, time, and energy while improving site safety. And I have actually included this slide to show that the hydro sleeves go to a lot nicer spots than I do, at least the one on the left. This is a golf course in Hawaii. For additional information, these are all covered in there. Our independent studies, I believe there are something like 16 of them now, or, and many of them complete, include cost comparisons as well as analytical comparisons, and these are available at the uh, link that's shown above. Instructional videos on how to use it, demonstrations of the speed of deployment, etc., are located in the video library. I want to thank you and uh, hope to hear from you in the future. 
This slide is included because many times people ask me where the idea of the hydro sleeve came from. I wish it came like this. Unfortunately, it didn't, but I thought it made a really good slide. We thought it would work out pretty well anyway. Thank you, and uh, like I say, we hope to hear from you soon. You can get in, uh, additional information also at info at hydrosleeve.com. Thank you.